I'm really pleased that, that Sally thinks that I got enough to say to set some, some time aside to just come to the mic and talk to you guys this morning. And I really do appreciate that. And uh, I'm going to try and, and, and make some sense out of an, of an effort that began here in Seattle that luckily now is a, is a, is a bit larger than us, but we're trying to make it even, even larger. And it's a pretty simple idea, but at the same time, we think it's pretty profound. So that the effort is that we want to have ordinary workers create a trade accord, a workers' trade accord, that, that brings together, I mean, that, that, that lays out ideas that are uh, the ideas or the rules by which we would trade the products that we produce. Now, so the first question I want to start out with is, what is it that we're talking about trading in the first place? We're talking about trading the products that workers manufacture worldwide, the products that ordinary workers manufacture worldwide. We're talking about trading the products that, I mean, we're trading the goods that are extracted from, from the earth, whether it's fishing, or whether it's logging, or mining, and so on. And we're talking about trading agricultural products that are produced by ordinary working people. So in every case here, the products that we're talking about trading is produced by who? The exact same people who are not engaged in, in what the rules are that allow for these products to be traded. So the people who make the rules about how it gets traded are the ones who trade currencies. They trade something that's totally intangible. And if, you, if we think about these currency traders, these are the folks who hold referendums on a daily basis on ideas and decisions that are made by governments, whether they're de democratic governments or undemocratic governments, but so that a currency trader can decide that the decision made by some government somewhere in the world is in fact counter to what they want and they can ruin that, that, that country's economy overnight. And we know that this is the case. We, but we haven't put together some kind of idea to say this shouldn't be the case, that decisions that are made by a government that's elected by the people ought to be the decision that stands and not one that is decided by some currency traders offshore someplace and can decide that this economy now has to go into receivership. We saw that happen in Asia this, last year and the year before last. So now, if we pay attention to the news, what we'll see is, what we hear, is that the Asian crisis is going away. Well, I would, I would say to you, if you look a little closer, it's, it's, it's uh, the Asian economy is reopening under new management. Mm -hmm. So that now, the, now banks in the West are going to own the banks in Korea. The Koreans were keeping them out for a while there. And so their own elite was owning the country. But now it's opening back up under the ownership of European and American banks. So when we, when we look at this question of trade, we're raising a whole new issue. And what we're saying is that those of us who produce the world's goods ought to be the ones who are engaged in discussions about how we, how we transfer the, these goods between us. Now, who thinks that ordinary working people can, in fact, come up with these kinds of ideas? And I would come back and, and, and respond is that, who is it that solves all the complex problems that production presents on a daily basis? Every day, production presents problems. Yet the world's economy works like a 
well oil, a well built clock. So I work on the waterfront, and I can talk to you as a waterfront worker from my perspective that I watch cargo come across the docks every day. And this cargo doesn't go off to some warehouse and sit around for days at a time or weeks at a time or months at a time. It's on a shelf in Chicago a few, a few days later so that somebody can look at that cargo and decide that there used to be a time when when uh, the employees or, or the retailers had to have warehouses and pay inventory taxes and so on. Now they get next day delivery so that there's a shelf sitting at Macy's that's reserved for something that's on its way there tomorrow. And they know where it is. They can look in the computer and say, these dresses are on a truck being delivered from the rail yard and they'll be here tomorrow. Are, these, are those dresses are on a ship 25 miles off the coast of Washington State? Are those dresses are on their way to the port in uh, Hong Kong? They can tell this now on a daily basis. And so they no longer use warehouses and pay inventory taxes or overstock and then have to t go on sale because we've solved those complex, prob complex problems of production. We also have to solve them because our lives are at risk. So yesterday I sat in my truck and I watched a refrigeration mechanic who had to, when, when once they load the refrigeration containers on the ship, there's a cord that has to be plugged in down at the bottom. But they stack these containers three, four high, and there's no ladder or no steps to get up to the top one. And they can't leave the cord hang because the, the crane can't pick up the container high enough to get it up with the cord hanging down. So the cord gets wound up onto the container and put in inside of uh, the shelf. And then the container is sitting up on the ship. So now you can imagine it's five or six stories high. And this worker climbs up these shackles and reaches in and gets the cord so it can drop down, so he can climb down and plug it in. But it's dangerous. So now he has to solve the problem in order to stay alive because he can't refuse not to do the work. Because if he does, he's out of a job. So, we, so all the complex problems that, that, that production presents to us on a daily basis, we solve them. So that these lights work in here. That the, the buses run up and down the street in our country's work. And we do this worldwide. But what we do know is that we're not engaged in discussion about trade. We're not engaged in discussions about foreign policies. Now, I want to I want to take a minute here and, and and have us follow a the manufacturing of of uh, chassis that that uh, that are used in in this world trade. If, if people people look at these containers that we see going up and down the freeways now, they come off the ships, and they set them on the back of these, they set them on these chassis, and then a truck hooks to them, and it looks like it's a part of the truck, and they haul it all over this, this part of the country, or they set them on trains, and they take them away. But the chassis, because this, this new containerized cargo is a, is, is a new system that didn't exist 35 or 40 years ago. And so, in, in the 1970s, these chassis had to be manufactured. They were brand new. So they made them here in the United States. But the conditions in the United States and Canada were such that they were paying too much to the workers. So they moved the manufacturing of these chassis to South Korea. 
So if you look at the chassis on the waterfront, look at the stickers on them, it say built in Detroit or made in Ontario, 1978, 1979. And then you find another one made in the 1980s and it was manufactured in Seoul. Hmm? But then you keep looking and you find another one in the 1990s that were manufactured in Tijuana, Mexico. Because if we remember, the Korean workers won a degree of democracy in the 1980s. Huh? And so the Korean workers are doing pretty good. They got some rights and they, they organized and they were independent trade unions. And so they were doing too well to manufacture these, to, to build these, these chassis. So the chassis moved back across the Pacific and they started building them down in Tijuana. Well, last year, the workers in Tijuana went out on strike. They were making $5 a day at the Hong Yong uh, assembly plant. This was a Korean company building chassis in Tijuana, Mexico. Those workers went out on strike and the government couldn't run them back to work. So the chassis went back across the Pacific. And now if you go down to the waterfront, there's 250 chassis that came in last week from China, made by the Chinese workers for 35 cents an hour. So there's a relationship between our situation and the Chinese worker situation, or our situation and the Mexican worker situation, that our wages are tied, our wages and the conditions are tied to theirs. Somebody sent me a, a, a document the other day, and some of you might have read it, and before I go on, I just want to just, just mention this quote. But it was, it's a quote by an indigenous woman who says, and in Nostop, this group of Minnesota puts this poster out, and it says, that, that if you come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you see your liberation tied up with mine, then let's work together. And so that's the point of view that we take into this work of uh, a workers' trade accord, is that our liberation, our welfare is tied to the liberation and the welfare of workers in Tijuana, Mexico, and or Seoul, South Korea and or Beijing, China, or wherever. So that, that's the attitude, and that's the, that's the spirit in which we take this up. Now the question that ought to be to me is then why, why are we talking about this happening at the, at the level of the AFL-CIO Executive Committee? Or why are you bringing ordinary workers from South Africa to these kinds of meetings when Kusatu is, has been a staunch organization? And let me tell you before I go on, because I don't want to have to deal with this question of being anti-union today. Because my interest is tied directly to a strong union. My wages are tied to that. The conditions that I work under are tied to that. So I don't want to have to defend myself as being anti-union. But I'm opposed to the policies of my union. I'm opposed, we oppose to the policies of the AFL-CIO. Because they, their position ends up too often tying us to capitalist production, that there are no other alternatives to this. And we think that there are. So we, when we look at what happened in South Africa, in South Africa, Kusatu, we think was the principal, the principal group that calls for the transition, the peaceful transition from minority rule to majority rule. Kusatu was a principal player there. But now Kusatu has, Kusatu has joined with the ANC in developing a structural adjustment program that mirrors the same one that the rest of Africa has had to, has, has had to bite. Now, I'm going to take a little time and explain it because this is what, this is what underlies our position about ordinary workers taking up this question. Now, when, when Kusatu called for a stay away in South Africa, demanding that the 
national parties set a date for the elections. 85% of South African workers stayed home on the first day. 80% stayed home. On the second day, 85% stayed home. And that night, the clerks set, set the date for the election. That was the power of the South African workers. That was, the, now, at the, they had developed a redevelopment plan. And the redevelopment plan called for housing, called for jobs, called for hospitals and schools. And what happened, this put the South African people first because people are living on the ground. People don't have health care. People don't have jobs or schools. The crime is rampant in South Africa. Hmm? But there's a reason for all of this. But the problem with the redevelopment plan that came from underneath, came from down below, was that it wouldn't attract foreign capital. It wouldn't attract foreign investments. And so, Tambo and Becky and the ANC decided that they, had, they couldn't just adopt because their rhetoric had already foreclosed this question of a structural adjustment program from the World Bank. So they negotiated something different and they called it the GEAR. But the GEAR is in fact a structural adjustment program. The leadership of Kusatu had gone into the government and now they have a structural adjustment program or they've approved one and so, it, so that if, so when they show up here, they're going to have the same, they're going to be making the same arguments about the WTO that the AFL-CIO is making. They have to make it because their whole policy is tied to attracting foreign investments. So. We don't think that ordinary workers can just up, up and overturn the system overnight. But what we think we can do is say that, look, we, have ground, we want to establish ground rules for the exchange of our products. And these ground rules will include, will, will require that anybody we're doing business with, and, and we do business with them now, but I just said we solved the, all the problems of production on a daily basis. But when a container comes across the docks in Seattle, it's coming loaded with tennis shoes from Indonesia, for example. That we can put requirements on those tennis shoes, on those, those products as they arrive here, that they must have been manufactured by workers who have the right to organize. We can't make workers in Indonesia organized. It's not our business. But we can, we can say that they have to have the right to do it. We think that they will do it if they have the right to do it. But not only because anybody gets organized, mm -hmm. capitalist production is organized. The capitalist just does the organizing. And no such thing as unorganized workers. I mean, you can't build this building by yourself. But, now, but I'm going to finish this point, and I want to go back and talk about the difference between organized labor and unorganized labor. But, but when, uh, so that, so that when, when goods come across the frontier, our position is that these goods have to be manufactured by workers who have the right to organize. But not only that, they, but that their employers have to recognize their organizations. So it doesn't do any good to have these laws that set aside some little thing on the side and say you got the right to organize, but nobody else recognizes your organization. It doesn't do any good to be organized. So workers have the right to organize and their, and their, their employers must, must recognize their organizations. We would, we would also demand, we would also require that there be an international minimum wage. Hmm. Now here's an argument against this. And ordinary workers make this argument now. So well, things are cheaper in Mexico, or things are cheaper in Brazil, or in Taiwan. So they don't need to make $20 an hour like we do here. Well. 
I'm not advocating that everybody around the world have two car a two car garage. I think there's a problem with the way we've organized our society, but we're not talking about that. But where do they make a 35 cents an hour VCR? Hmm? Or is it that workers in South Africa or workers in Namibia don't aspire to watch the television? They don't make a 35 cents an hour VCR or refrigerator. Something more, even more important, like a refrigerator. They don't. They don't make those those kinds of things, so that workers around the world have a desire to not just produce, but to consume as well. And you can't consume on 35 cents an hour. So this argument about you can have lower wages somewhere else because things are cheaper. Things are not cheaper. If you live off the land, it might, if you live outside of the cash economy, it might be cheaper. But, but the people who live outside the cash economy are being forced into the cash economy by the, by the, the, by the, 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 the new global economy, so to speak. So now when we get flowers in February, they don't come from some f farm here in, in northern Washington. So, it, so at Valentine's Day, when we, uh, Mother's Day, when we go out and buy, buy flowers that haven't bloomed yet in our country, they're coming from South America. They're coming from for the land that's been appropriated, which the peasants were living off of the land for, for the last thousand years. Now they've been moved off the land so they can grow flowers that get sold up in the, in the, the more developed countries. But they don't take the worst land and bring in the irrigation, they take the best land. The land that's closest to the railways, the land that's closest to transportation routes, the land that's closest to the water because they can be irrigated. And they've been forced into the cash economy. And those workers either have to, I mean, they become part of the production process but not part of the consumer process. But they, their aspirations are to consume. Do anybody know what happened to the people who don't consume and who don't produce? See, we got three different categories here. We got people who consume and produce. We got people who consume and don't produce. That's the rich folks. And then we got people who don't consume or produce. Now they're being asked to disappear. They're being asked just to go away. And those, and those who, but those who produce and don't consume are going to keep being asked to produce, of course. But how do you do that on 35 cents an hour? Because now you be, now you straddle the, you straddle a, a system here. You're in the middle of having produced but nothing to consume. And if, if you travel in, travel in the developing countries, what you've seen is that these producers who produce during the day, the other part of their families are out on the streets bending. There's this other so-called microeconomy where people are out there cooking on the streets or selling uh, items on the streets that they, they cooked at home the night before, the microeconomy. These are all, these, these situations have been developed by ordinary working people as means of, of survival because the system doesn't, doesn't pay them enough to consume them. So, that, so that we're saying that the wages, there has to be an international minimum wage. So that's the second, the, 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 the second point about a workers' trade accord, the question of immigration. This is where we go astray at. This is where people, people agree with us about the right to organize. They agree with about the minimum wage thing even. But when we get to the immigration question, people say, oh, you guys are crazy. Because our position is that there should be no frontiers that restrict the movement of working people. That workers should have the right to move across frontiers the way capital has the right to move across it. Now, of course, what workers in our country, what pe I shouldn't say workers, people in our country say, oh, that's ridiculous. You open the gates and everybody's going to come from Mexico coming up here. 
Well, I hate to tell it, you know, let the secret out, but the Mexicans don't like coming up here. <laughs> they just soon stay in Mexico where they speak the language, where their families live at, you know, where the weather is better at, huh? But they're forced up here. And if you remove these barriers, if you're paying the proper wages, if you, if you stop restricting somebody, if you, if you say that the, the, the domestic wages, the prevailing wages is 10 cents an hour and I can't move, guess how much I'm going to work for? Hmm? I'll work for 10 cents an hour because I can't move. But if you remove the barrier of my moving, you got to raise my wages, because otherwise I'm going to split on you. So we can win the argument about immigration. We just haven't been engaged in it. So, and, and then finally, this question of the, the fourth one would be the question of the environment. Mm -hmm. So who, so that we would establish rules that says we, that the environment, well, for, first of all, when we started this discussion, I have to tell you guys, when this discussion, when we, at our first meeting, and I haven't even talked about how we came together, but the first time we sat down to talk about these issues, a worker from Haiti said, I don't think we ought to be talking about the environment. That's one that we can leave to the white liberals. Now, that's, not, that's not our issue. They'll take care of that. But then somebody else got up and said, let me tell you about how the degradation of the environment affects the jobs, it affects the lives of working people on a daily basis. So what happened to the people in, in the Nigerian Delta when shale oil, doesn't, there's no rules for the extraction of oil and they spoil all of the, uh, the, the fishing holes? When they destroyed the rivers, and people, people could no longer make a living or, or no longer feed themselves because the fish are all dead. And the other folks talked about what happened with the degradation of the forest, and people who live off the forest or live in the forest and near the forest. And so this British worker got up and said, you know, said in the most elegant t terms that when this discussion began, I didn't think it, it, it included me, it involved me, because I work at the Ford Motor Plant outside of London. But now, having heard the discussion from all the people about how working people are affected by the degradation of the environment on a daily basis, it's my understanding, I'm, gonna, I'm quoting him now, he's, he said, his understanding is that unless we appropriate the Greens' agenda, they'll appropriate our jobs. Because the idea is that production and the protection of the environment are in contradiction to each other. It's the kind of production that's in contradiction, not production per se. So that if we take up these questions, and that's the point that I'm, I'm standing here making today, is that what, what, what we're moving to try to organize, and, and the discussion that we're trying to begin, or that we have begun, that we're saying should continue, and particularly around this, in, in, in November around the WTO, is that we can have an accord, an accord that's not produced by capital, but one that's produced by work, the people who, who do the production in the first place, and that that discussion shouldn't be confined to confine excuse me, to a handful of Americans or to the most powerful sector of the labor movement or the, the most organized sector of the labor movement. But it ought to be done by people who don't have an interest separate and apart from other working people. And I, I'm going to deviate just for one minute because I'm going to talk about the trade union leadership for just a minute because I think it's important for us to understand why it is that they're, going, they're abandoning, us, abandoning us on this issue, this issue of 
opposing this current world trade position. In spite of the, in spite of the rhetoric about having the right to organize and so on, these so-called core labor principles, we're going to get abandoned by the trade union leadership. Now, why am I saying this? But, but let me just, just, just tell you a little bit about how this, 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 this scenario plays itself out. About, two, about three years ago, we had a strike here in Seattle. The Boeing workers went out on strike. And when, 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 when labor leaders have the ability to go in and negotiate a contract without, without rank and file's involvement, they, could, they, they work out deals that might not necessarily be in the interest of the, all, all the workers themselves. And they come back and they get these, uh, these, these uh, contracts ratified by the workers. Well, I was leaving town and there was a newspaper in the airport that says, Boeing workers settle strikes. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry they, they, they bought off on that, that sorry negotiation that was going on. But I came, I came back to town, picked up the newspaper, and it said, Boeing workers, blah, 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 still on strike. And I thought, well, we could go there and settle the strike. Now I'm back and the strike is still going on. Because what happened was the workers turned down what the leadership negotiated. But the negotiations were going on again. And do you all know who was negotiating? When John Majors was con he had his seat contested by Tony Blair. Tony Blair got the most votes. See, John Major didn't get to go back to the table. He was out of work. <laughs> but when our leadership goes in and cuts a deal with management and we say we don't like the deal, they go back in and cut another deal. We don't get to send new people in who share our point of view. They go back to the table and say, now, what kind of deal can we get that we can sell them? Excuse me. And so that's our argument with, with one of our arguments with, with the way that our movement is structured. And I just said something that I want to end this with. I talked about our movement. So that one sector of our movement has appropriated the voice of all of us. And so when I, when I get up to talk about the trade union leadership, it's like blasphemous. I'm, I mean, I'm anti-union. I'm pro-union. I'm pro-democratic union. I'm pro-worker. I'm pro-labor movement. But the labor movement is not, does not stop at the 15% of the workers who are organized into trade unions. The labor movement is uh, women and men who are driven off welfare, who are in the workfares, who are being pushed into the labor force. The labor movement are immigrants who are being forced across the frontier because the wages and conditions are so bad in their own country, sometimes, most of the time based on the export of capital from our own country. The labor movement are people are the unemployed who are unable to find jobs. The, the labor movement is, is brown, it's black, it's white, it's women. It's women's organizations who are fighting for the rights uh, uh, for equal pay, for maternity leave, for family leave. That's the labor movement. Not a handful of organized people who, who are speaking for all of us. Yeah, we don't have the voice. And I often hear this argument is, you might, the labor movement, 85% might be unorganized, but they ain't got no voice. That's true. And so, we're raising our voices. We're trying to find ways. So under ordinary workers who I'm speaking about today who we're trying to bring together to develop this trade accord are not necessarily members of trade unions, but they're pro-labor. So I'm going to stop, and I hope I made some, made some sense, and I probably should have talked some more about the idea of the, the, the structure of how this is happening. I, I will just one minute. So the idea is, Sally talked about there's meetings, there's meetings taking place in July in Mexico City with workers from the United States, the Caribbean, Mexico, and Canada. 
to, to have these discussions about the trade accord. There are workers meeting in September in South Africa and in Jakarta to have the same discussions. There are meetings planned in, in Sao Paulo and in London, but they, there's no date set for them. But the idea is to bring together ordinary rank and file to do what we've been talking about here. Around, and under those, the four points I talked about, immigration, the environment, the rights of workers to organize, and the effects of the global economy on women. And so thank you for the time. <laughs>